Welcome back to the Tech Talks Daily Podcast. Now, a few questions for you today. When we talk about defining property in the digital environments that we're creating and securing personal data in an age when it has become fully commoditized, where do we start here? And will the digital economy remain as it is? Will it continue to evolve? Or is it at risk of going bust right now? And what are your thoughts on the current state of the NFT market and the future of NFTs? We all saw the hype that surrounded NFTs. Is that still there? Are things changing? Is it descending into the wild, wild west? Well, these are just a few of the topics that today's guest is going to tackle with me. And I'm excited to get him on. He's an absolutely great guy. His name is Sean Moss Pultz, and he is recognized as an open source hardware pioneer, especially having founded and served as CEO of Open Moco which many of you will know is the world's first open source phone and precursor to the iPhone and Android smartphones. But today, he is now the co-founder and CEO of Bitmark, which is a blockchain startup that aims to bring traditional property rights into the digital age, all by providing tools that enable anyone to affirm ownership and control digital assets they create and post online. And they've already raised, I think, over $10 million from investors far and wide from Alibaba, Kevin Lin, who's the co-founder of Twitch. And their clients include big names such as Pfizer, UC Berkeley, Health to Sync, KKbox, and the list goes on. But one of their products is Autonomy, which is described as the world's first and only digital wallet that allows traders to showcase their NFT collection and view it on any screen, TV, projector, or or oh, indeed, anywhere. So buckle up and hold on tight, because no matter where you're listening in the world, it's time for me to beam your ears all the way to San Diego, where Sean is waiting to speak with us today. So a massive warm welcome to the show. Can you tell the listeners a little about who you are and what you do? Sure. So my name is Sean Mosspoltz. Uh, I would describe myself as really like an engineer at heart that became a reluctant businessman. And became a businessman only because I had some ideas that were in my head that when I was working at companies, they were too too radical, too outside the box, um, too experimental. And so I had to kind of go down that journey that a lot of people do to try to get things built um, in the real world. It's 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 quite painful. <laughs> <laughs> And from the moment we connected straight away on your Zoom, I noticed there was a 2001 Space Odyssey image on there, and I I thought there's got to be a space connection somewhere. And I'd love to find out more about how you got to your current role. So can you share your origin story, where your passion for tech came from, or just a moment that that put you on this path you're on today? Yeah, so I mean, I've programmed computers from a super young age. My parents bought me an x86, so this, this was like, I guess probably Intel's first computer in that um, uh, x86 um, series that went on all the the Pentium. So it goes way back to that. But really, I was in graduate school. Well, I wasn't in graduate school. I was in, uh, I was sort of on the fence of should I go into graduate school? I was taking graduate courses. um, And my best friend from from school, still my best friend to this day, uh, he was Taiwanese. And he said, hey, I'm going to go back to Asia and do you want to come with me? And so I went there and uh, one of those like epiphany moments where I just felt that everything I knew was from reading books and I had to go out and see the world. And so I traveled for about a half a year and there was two career paths, if you will, that I was pursuing. Of course, one would be technology related to engineering, computer science, things like that. And then the other this is kind of a funny story. I was designing men's shoes. So wow. yeah, um, uh, part of what I was doing to pay for college was uh, I was making websites. This was back in the late 90s, early 2000s. And one of my clients was a, a luxury shoe brand company. And um, they wanted a fresh look. So they actually had me come in and design some shoes for them. So I had this kind of fork in the road like really like literally fork in the road. Do I go into shoe design or do I go over to Asia and um, learn how to do hardware? So I was, I was a software person and I just was fascinated with how things get made. And um, well, obviously I went um, uh, to the, the path untraveled for me at least. And that was to go over to Asia, learn a foreign language, learn a foreign culture, learn 
um, the foreign language of foreign culture was actually manufacturing. <laughs> Chinese too, but but the manufacturing was harder to learn than Chinese. <laughs> but it feels like a, a real sliding doors moment. Do you ever sit around and think what could have happened if you chose that that other route then? I got some advice from somebody in my early 20s, and he said that whenever I'm presented with two options, take the path that would be the most unknown for you. Uh-huh. And so I've never looked back on those kind of things because I've yeah. always been like since that moment in life, I said, okay, that's how I'm gonna that's how I'm gonna decide what, what I do. Um yeah. if I'm given the option of something that feels easy, something that feels uh more difficult, I have to have more skin in the game, there's greater risk. I almost always go in that direction because somehow like that leads to things that are unpredictable. And that unpredictability of the journey is where I find um well, I guess I would say the most meaning, but the truth is, is I just find the most growth. Yeah. It's not always fun, but in the end, it's like, yeah, when I take the easy road, that's usually the things I regret in the end. Wow. What a great origin story. I love how you've gone from making men's shoes to building websites <laughs> to the path that would eventually lead you to become the co-founder and CEO of Bitmark, which is a blockchain startup that aims to bring traditional property rights, but into a digital age. And there's so much room for improvement in that world. So I, I think you do this by providing tools that enable anyone to affirm ownership and control uh, digital assets that they create and post online. So I know a lot of people see this space as a bit of the wild, wild world. So can you tell me more about the story behind the company and the problems that you ultimately set out to solve here? Yeah, we can actually start with the wild, wild west. So yeah. um, we have something in common here and that we both have this common law, English law, Yeah, um, you being overseas and me being here uh, in America. And I mean, property rights is this really radical concept that was created for land first and then extended to knowledge. So patents and trademarks and copyrights. And then when the internet came around, really, it was only lawyers, IP lawyers, that got involved. And so everything that you do on the internet looks like a license agreement. You don't really have ownership. You don't have property rights. It's like renting a home versus owning a home. And the way I actually backed into this realization was um, somewhat interesting. Let me, let me share this story. So my dad is actually a, a property lawyer. He does estate planning. Mm. And uh, I was getting married, and this was back in 2011, 2012. My wife got pregnant, um, so I was going to be a dad. And my dad, who does these estates and trusts, he wanted to make a trust for my family. He said that that's what you do when you have assets that you want to pass on. And he said, so what assets do you want to put into your trust, is what my dad asked me. And I said, well, uh, can I put my, my eBooks, my music, of course, digital music, my Bitcoin. He's, he's like, your what coin? And I'm like, my Bitcoin. <laughs> and 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 so, so all of that stuff I just told you about the history of property rights, I learned that because my dad had no idea what to do with Bitcoin. He asked me, well, is it property? And I'm like, well, what is property? And because the lawyers are used to being able to go to the banks and go to the courts and say, hey, look, these are the rules that we would like to happen when when catastrophe happens or when, you know, when, when someone passes away and none of that stuff exists for internet things. I mean, you, you can, you can read all of these weird stories of people that have had their Facebook accounts, like they've died, unfortunately, and their Facebook accounts, they can't shut it down. Yeah. Um, and there's, there's all kinds of just, and I look at it not from the perspective of loss, but from the perspective of potential gain, right? Mm -hmm. And and each time we've expanded property rights. So each time individual people have been able to own something. So when individual people could own land and it was no longer just kings and queens and churches, fantastic wealth was created. I mean, real estate is a 270 plus, you know, um, a billion, uh, a trillion dollar asset class. It's a, ma- a billion asset. It's a massive, massive asset class. And similar with you know IP and um, and patents. And there's all kinds of, of course, issues with patents. But I mean, software companies couldn't exist without IP. And um, and so the really the technology sector itself is based on IP. And now we get into this world where more and more of our time is spent online in the digital environment. And um, I felt at least that somebody should start a company that went about trying to extend this 
concept of property rights extend this to digital ownership, to digital things, because at least at the time, um, I felt the most valuable things, the things I wanted to preserve, the things I wanted to, like the things I thought would generate wealth, they were all digital. Wow. And just to hone in on one area specifically there, can, can you expand on how you're defining property in this digital environment and inevitable Web3 future we're heading towards? I mean, this will lead us into the NFT space incredibly yeah. quickly. The way that the way that lawyers define property or just society itself has defined mm. property is it's it's the relationship between an asset and a human. And it's the relationship actually, it's the social contract between other humans and that human and that asset. So it's this really like, it's it's really almost like you could think of it as a, one of the main pillars of how society gets structured. It's the rights to things, um, specifically like how resources are used, who gets them, how they're you know, um, who, who defends those rights, like all of this stuff is, this is how society gets, gets absolutely structured. And so what we try to do is to take the same concepts. So there's this idea of a title, a property title, and the title is this unique identifier to something that is stored in a registry. And traditionally the registries would be either county-based or state-based or federal-based. Um, in the U.S., we have the U.S. Patent Trademark Office. We have local land registries. We have all of these things. And if you take a step back and you say, what job do these things do? What they do is they, they organize the social and economic attributes that are useful so people can transact around them, so they can form societies around them, communities around them. It's probably a better way of looking at it. And then you say, okay, well, could the internet use that sort of thing? And you'd be like, wow, actually, that's exactly what the internet needs. The, the, the way that people organize now is largely either a couple of Western tech companies or a couple of Eastern tech companies. Maybe you have Tencent, Baidu, Alibaba in the East or in the West, you have whatever, Facebook, Apple, Google, and they dictate how everything gets organized, how everything gets used. They dictate what is socially useful and what is not. And a property system is always decentralized, right? Like um, I, I own an iPhone. I can do whatever I want with that iPhone. I can give it to you. I could, I could use the iPhone to bash in uh, a nail if I wanted to. I mean, Apple's not going to say I can't do that. But the moment <laughs> the digital anything, an app on my iPhone, um, a message I want to send, the moment it gets into the digital space is the moment that the um, the liberties that that we've built up over hundreds of years as a society, those go away. And now it's, well, Apple doesn't think you should be able to pay for something with that payment system because that's against their business model. And, and, and it's, you know, nothing against Apple's business model. They have a great business model. But it's, I think as people, we need to take a step back and say, these very old concepts of property, they were created out of struggles. And these struggles were real. Right, the, the 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 original land property rights created the agricultural revolution and then the industrial revolution, and 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 now we really find ourselves in a in a in a stage where where I feel that if there was an expansion of property rights, if there was more things that individuals can own as opposed to less, that there could be a lot of wealth that could be unlocked, both both social and economic wealth. Not I'm not speaking strictly about uh, yeah. economic wealth. Really, there's a whole bunch of new ways that people could organize and organize resources that they want to use if we had um, property systems that were outside of the control of a single corporation or a single country. Because I think like it's quite obvious now that that it's not it's not in anyone's best interest for a single country to control how other countries get to use stuff or allocate resources. That sucks. It really does. And apologies to go off at a tangent here, but I'm curious, have you been following the uh, the goings on with chat GPT at the moment? Because I'm reading more and more about copyright and IP from content that's been generated by the platform, by machine learning as it's learning. And then who owns that content as people create it and use it and how much of it is, is owned by the user and how much by the platform. And then they're, they're signing a deal with Bing and Microsoft. Things get very cl cloudy very quickly, don't they? They do. And, and, and all of that complexity, if you go up one level, yeah. then you have to ask, okay, well, which copyright regime are you talking about? Are you talking mm -hmm. about the US's, England's, yeah. 
Singapore's, China's, Japan's, because they're all subtly different, yeah. right? And it's and and in a global world where things are borderless, where you make something online, so you do something in Chat GPT, and then you share it with people, and it goes over these social networks in different countries. Okay, now you've made an absolute mess of the entire world's legal system. Yeah, everything breaks down, and so I think like in that in areas where things just don't make sense, where it's like dividing by zero, that's where the interesting stuff happens. And it was really that realization that, oh, these property rights, these are just undefined. They don't exist. Yeah. That's where I was like, okay, somebody's got somebody's to do something there. And, and that, that was sort of the, the sliver, if you will, that was like rammed into my head that just got more and more annoying. And I'm like, okay, I'm gonna start a company. <laughs> <laughs> and as you said a few moments that a few moments ago, that takes us very quickly into the world of NFTs. Some people get it, some people will never get it. But I, of course, you must read a lot of stories around this. Some will frustrate and anger you, I would imagine. So, just to is there any way we can lay to rest any common myths about any NFTs that uh, you've read about recently that particularly frustrate you that we could just remove from the conversation straight away? I mean, some of the. Some of the myths that still persist, which is so funny to me, for some reason, people don't see this connection is that like this, this kind of right click save as well, like I can just take the JPEG or I can take the movie and I can watch it. Like, why do I, why do I need an NFT? Or yeah. like I buy an NFT and people are like, well, you don't even, you, like, like, what do you actually own? Like the, this, this NFT is silly. And if you kind of root this into again, root this into traditional notions of property rights. You valet park your car. The valet doesn't own your car. Like just yeah. because they can get in your car doesn't mean it's theirs. I mean, that's silly, right? I mean, that's the stupidest concept on earth. I mean, I, I, I remember in New York Times, they had this article and they were basically, I mean, the way I would look at it was they were, they were basically saying that, oh, well, um, I can just save your JPEG. So it's mine anyways. It's like, no, that's not the way property rights work. <laughs> Like, I mean, it's the stupidest thing on earth, right? And 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 and, it, and it's even stupid in it's even stupid in a world where you don't need a police force to defend it because, like, okay, you take that JPEG that you had and you go take it to OpenSea or any other marketplace, and you go and you try to sell something where you don't have the NFT. Okay, yeah. how do you do that? Right. <laughs> so this NFT is actually, I don't want to say all NFTs are property titles. Yeah. Um, but definitely all property titles would be NFTs in the sense that they are records that, and I mean, really the way I think of an NFT is it's a piece of data that can be manipulated with computer programs. And these programs are called smart contracts. And these smart contracts, they, they operate on these new kinds of computers that are called blockchains. So there's, there's, there's all kinds of confusion around the terminology of this whole space, but definitely, um, definitely this, kind of laughability of the NFT, um, the myth, the biggest myth is sort of this NFT is just for whatever apes and monkeys, and it's not useful. Yeah. Um, it is a it is a property title. So it's a title for your home, a title for your car that is programmable, that has a payment system attached to it. So you could do all kinds of interesting things like, hey, when I use this at that time, a payment gets made that way. I can share it with you. A payment gets made that way. And it can all be done globally. And to go back to this idea of conflicting legal systems, the most interesting thing about it is that you can attach the rules that you think are interesting and you can run experiments on those rules. So copyright, like we touched on a moment ago, was actually a solution to a um, 16th century problem. So the printing press, like how do you distribute this stuff that was concocted really largely in the 17th century. And then it was, um, modified again in the 18th century and the 19th century. So it's dealing with problems that are hundreds of years old. And so the particular copyright regimes that we have in place right now were created for printing presses, were created for the distribution of, say, digital or um, uh, radio and television, right? Things that were always local, things that were always based in one particular state, right? And now we have all of these new assets that are based globally that can flow across the entire world. And the only technology that I see capable of potentially, I'm not, it's definitely not a slam dunk, but potentially addressing these issues, potentially 
being able to let people again innovate with property rights in a way that's sensible to create new ways of um the purpose of copyright was to help to advance sciences and useful arts that was the purpose of it right like the government wanted a system that would help people to innovate and to be rewarded for innovation right and so we have a chance to innovate again on what rights should be associated with what type of assets and again these digital assets are the interesting ones so the nft is is like the title to your home it's you know you want to get a loan against your home well you better be able to show you hold title to the home if you don't they're like hey that's not your home like that's <laughs> that's, that's not your home you don't own that home like no sorry valet that's not your car you can't you can't take that person's car and and sell it right so so we have a chance with the nft to really reinvent copyright regimes across the world, re reinvent the way property rights regimes get allocated across the world. So it's not necessarily just sort of communism or capitalism. Communism is the state decides how rights get allocated. Capitalism is individuals decide how rights get allocated. It's not necessarily these extremes. You could have all sorts of different experiments, all sorts of different permutations. And so I think if, if I could just pause there for a moment, the greatest myth, like linger on this for a moment, the greatest myth is just that these NFTs are for apes and monkeys and they're silly. Yeah. Quick reminder that this podcast is brought to you by Flipper, the number one marketplace to buy and sell online businesses and startups. So the question I'm going to ask you before I go is, do you own or run an online business? And have you ever considered selling your site, your store, your tech, or your app? Well, with world-class combined matching technology, dedicated brokers, and end-to-end -end services, all at the most efficient price, Flipper is making selling your online business simple. So to get a, a free valuation for your business, simply visit flipper.com slash tech talks, where each month thousands of online business owners are exiting with Flipper. Again, to learn more, visit Flipper dot com slash tech talks you can't halt progress and how arts in particular evolve i mean it wasn't too long ago that traditional photographers hated the fact of digital photography was uh, gathering pace and then they hated the fact that smartphone photography was coming and then now those same people in, in the digital world are, are very suspicious and distrusting of ai uh, photography too and ai art but it just keeps evolving and you need to keep up with that don't you yeah, and there's a really fascinating connection between AI and yeah. crypto and NFTs in particular that I think will emerge more and more. And it's so, so when when you have these these GPTs that are able to produce all sorts of things that are indistinguishable yeah. from, say, art or from journalism or from music or from culture, you take you know take your pick. They they can generate assets, if you will, that are um, that will fool anyone. Mm. Now, maybe not now. But very, very soon. I mean, anybody that's watched these GPs, these GPTs, um, from one to two to three, you're just like, holy shit, this is nuts. <laughs> yeah. And 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 so the one thing that they cannot fake or forge, if you will, would be cryptography, the digital signatures. So what would be like we could really easily foresee a future where if you had a an image or a photo or a fact or something that came out and you could not tell if it came from a human or a GPT and you could not tell if it was authorized or not, then the only thing that you would be able to distinguish one another by would be just, okay, well, who made it? And you would need to have a digital signature and you would need to have what they call provenance, like this history. So the, the, the signatures along the way, so you knew like, like the supply chain, you knew where this thing came from. So you knew it was actually created by a GPT and you knew which of these GPTs it was created with and you knew who was behind that. It's these signatures that are going to allow us to, to have trust and transparency again. So it's it's not like, hey, let's stop these things. Yeah. It's that let's actually use the best of the AIs and let's use the best of what's happening in the NFT crypto Web3 ecosystem to be able to create this, this transparency of where information has come from. Um, and, 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 and that's all tied into, um, the property rights because, because what, like a, the difference between say a property and a, a, a money is that the property has 
the origin and the history. It has all those steps. And so you know where this came from. So you know it just wasn't the valet that just managed to steal something, right? Um, whereas, you know, money and these 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 fungible things or these things coming out of GPTs right now that don't have any history, well, you don't know what it is. I mean, yeah. you, don't, you don't know where it came from. And that's that's okay for some things like the hundred dollar bill. You don't want to know where it came from. You don't, you don't need to know where it came from, but if you're, if you're looking at some news or some image, you actually want to know where it came from. It's really important. And before you came on the podcast today, I was doing a little research on, on what you're doing here. And I read that you recently raised, I think it was something like $10.3 million in funding from investors, including some pretty big names, such as Alibaba, uh, and Kevin Lin, a co-founder of Twitch, and your clients include Pfizer, UC Berkeley, Health to Sync, KK Box, and so many others. So, can you expand on this, the partnerships, and what it means both to your company and and equally your customers? Yeah, you bet. So, so that that number is um, how much we've raised to date. So we've done right. C round, A round, and then that was the B round. Um, we're primarily based in Asia, but now we completely got distributed. You know, the the whole kind of pandemic story where uh, everybody is like locked down in a home in a city and you're like, why the hell am I in a city? So you just like spread out. So I'm, I'm in San Diego for that reason. Right? Yeah. This is like, I, I can go surfing. Um, even if the pandemic comes back, I don't even care anymore. I mean, we'll go to the mountains, we'll go surfing. We'll, you know, we'll, we'll, the family's here now. So, um, the projects you also mentioned, uh, the relationships with Pfizer, we were working on things related to clinical trials. Um, turns out that when individuals can can um, pool their data together and have clear rights to that data, um, things like clinical trials can scale globally at just fantastic ideas. Um, all of that stuff got stopped when the pandemic came around. Um, even we, we were working, you mentioned KK Box, they're like the Spotify, but of Asia, we were working with them on a better payment system for um, um, for royalties, for streaming, music streaming. All of that stuff got stopped. And so what, what my company is doing now is digital art, like NFTs. Right? Yeah. And um, this is kind of a really, really fun story. So art was always a hobby project of ours. We were working primarily in the life sciences and in music, um, but we always ran these experiments. I shouldn't say always, but every couple of years we would run these experiments around art because, um, well, I have a number of friends that are artists. Uh, one person uh, in particular, uh, his name is Casey Reese. I've known him for almost 20 years now. He's been trying to make a living in digital art and digital art has always been marginalized. The institutions never thought of it as sort of legitimate. They thought of it as screensavers. Mm. And when all of these projects got stopped and suspended, when the pandemic came, came through, he asked me, hey, would you like to build an online art gallery together? Of course, of digital art. Mm. And the, the NFT craze took off really, I would say, um, June, July, something like that of uh, 2020. This is when it really started to kind of you could you could smell it, you could see something was happening. We started this gallery in March of 2020. So just absolutely fortuitous timing. And the whole idea was that we would produce a better bundle of rights for the artist and for the collector. So traditionally, an artist, when they make something, if it's if it's traditional artwork, a painting, a photographer, a, a photograph, a sculpture, they don't have any equity in that. It's not like a startup company. A, start, a startup company, you have like a pie and you divide this pie up and you also grow the pie, of course, you know, as, as you move yeah. um, uh, down these paths. But an artist um, doesn't get anything. So when they sell their artwork, that's it. They don't get any royalties like a musician would. They don't get any equity like a, like a startup founder would. And so we felt that, well, that's not right. We should make a better bundle of rights for them. And the way it traditionally works is if you're a collector, every time you want to show the artwork publicly, you have to get those rights cleared by someone. And it's a painful process. It's just a nasty process. Mm -hmm. And that doesn't make any sense because like just the way people want to, like one of the reasons people buy artwork is to show it off, right? And how do you show something off digitally? Well, you put it on your website, you put it on your social media feed. 
right? And so you have to clear rights every time anybody sees it. I mean, you have a huge mess on your hands. It just doesn't operate. Mm -hmm. So we came up with a bundle of rights for artists and for collectors that we felt would be better for both sides. And that sort of, um, that was the genesis, if you will, of this idea of, hey, we can make a better gallery for digital art. And then um, when that really took off, which was towards the end of last year, we also realized that the other side of that equation, so we were, we were um, publishing art, if you will, um, selling art, but the people that were buying the art, they were holding this artwork in, in crypto wallets that were really for cryptocurrencies and DeFi. If you wanted to say, take that artwork and put it on your TV or bring it with you on your phone so you could show it to friends, all of that experience was incredibly cumbersome. It just didn't work. Like you had to log into your laptop, uh, log into a web browser to even see the artwork that you purchased, right? So we started working on uh, something we call autonomy, which is a digital art wallet. So it's a crypto wallet, but it's built from the perspective of the NFTs first and the art first. So how do you actually experience this stuff? How do you show people? How do you bring it with you? How do you view it on different TVs, different projectors? Um, and then of course, just this very simple problem of how do you understand what's going on? Because things are moving so fast and there's so much noise out there. Yeah. How do you find good art to grow your collection? So we try to help people with that. So, so Bitmark, like we went from this incredibly broad property rights for everything to incredibly focused. Right now we're a hundred percent in on how do we make much better rights and tools for artists and collectors. Love that. Absolutely love it. And uh, as someone that is incredibly passionate about developing technologies for consumer electronics, internet services that, that empower humans with that focus on blockchain related projects and all that shines through in talking to you today. I'm curious, how do you see the world five years from now? Because much of what we're talking about, there are large sections of people that just don't get it at all. But I think that is at a tipping point now where that's going to change. But I'm curious, how do you see that world in five years from now? Uh, if you would have asked me, let's say, I guess, when did FTX crash? This was like three months ago, right? Yeah, yeah. If you would have asked me four months ago, I would have been super optimistic that we're almost there, that, um, that, that the technology is very solid and it's getting better each month. Like it's getting significantly better each month. And by technology, I'm specifically referring to these, these open, global, permissionless networks, so Bitcoin, Ethereum, these are the two biggest. These are the ones that really have network effects. But unfortunately, the way that, again, this comes down to like how you pool these assets, how you allocate these assets, how you use these assets. Um, it's much easier to just give these over to a third party, much easier to give these over to an exchange. Yeah. And so these exchanges were able to amass literally billions and billions of people's money. And they're run by, well, not all of them, of course, but far too many of them seem to be run by, by sociopaths that just have zero integrity. And I think that really hurt us. I think that really set back this whole sector. Now, the technology is neutral. The technology is solid. It gets stronger and stronger. Um, it works. But people look in and they say, man, you guys can't even get your own shit together. This is an absolute disaster, right? And, and it is, it is a disaster. And it failed in every way that the previous system failed in. All of the failure modes, you had centralized control, you had inside fraud, you had, um, gosh, I mean, tax evasion, you had all of kind of the nasty stories that you would come to expect from the financial sector. And so the biggest challenge for us people building in this web3 crypto space is that it's very easy to be a bad actor the same tools that allow you to empower people to hold on to their own money to be able to distribute the things that they create in really more equitable ways globally not just like you you can be an artist in brazil now you don't have to be in new york or london or los angeles you can be anywhere right? These exact same technologies allow somebody to go to the Bahamas and make their own money and fool a bunch of people. It's the same technology. It's a double-edged sword. It's like the sharpest samurai double-edged sword we've ever had. And 
it's really hard for me to see what the next one to two years are going to look like. I feel like it's yeah. very, very, very bumpy. We're still not through this stuff. And I think governments are going to really want to clamp down on it because a lot of people got hurt and a lot of people got hurt that didn't understand what they were doing in the first place. Mm. Um, you probably saw those commercials. I mean, I love Matt Damon. He's like one of my favorite actors, but what's he doing promoting crypto for FTX, right? Like, that's just, come on guys, like, don't do that, right? Yeah. <laughs> and and, and that, that's gonna take a while to get over. Like people will be burned by that and they won't come back quickly. Yeah. yeah, unfortunately, so many examples like that of uh, celebrities that took the that big check. But uh, when talking to you today, one of the things we've got to discuss here is you're widely recognized as an open source hardware pioneer, having founded and served as CEO of OpenMoco too, the world's first open source phone and precursor to the iPhone and Android smartphone. So I've got to ask, what advice would would you give to any smart, driven college student about to enter the real world? And what advice should they ignore? What, what would you pass down to them? Well, so I still really believe in this idea that it's it's all about the journey. That yeah. the journey, like that, that is like the meaning is in the journey. Like the meaning of life, no, it's in the journey. You will yeah. find it in the journey. And which journey? Well, take the journey that's the most unpredictable. Now, to be a bit more specific about your question, because I think it's a great question. If I was starting over again, and who knows, maybe I will start over again one of these days, right? Yeah. Um, I would, I would ask myself, is there something that I believe that the world needs that it doesn't have, and that I'm willing to? put a lot of sweat and blood and tears and all this kind of stuff, like really put a lot of effort into that thing. Like I, I, I can't get up in the morning and not think about that thing. And if yeah. it is, then I'll start a company. And if I don't have something like that, I would look around me and I would find the companies that are building the things that I believe that need to be in this world. And I would look to specifically the people in those companies. And is there somebody that I feel I could learn from that I feel could be a great teacher? Because again, it comes down to this. Um, I like to always tell my team that you know, there's many things that, that, that work in theory, but not in practice, right? And kind of the corollary to this is the gap between theory and practice is always much bigger in practice than in theory. And so it's really important to just get a lot of practice to just work and to just be around people that are making things that are becoming real. It's really, really, really difficult to do that. And so if you can find somebody that's good at building something, if you can find somebody that has a track record of being able to deliver something that was useful, then go work for them. Yeah. And you'll be exposed to so many new things. And then who knows? Like, because because starting companies, I believe, is really one of the most difficult things there is to do, full stop. Mm. Right? And you really should only do it if you feel like there's no other choice, that if you don't do it, this thing is not going to exist. No, I completely agree with you. Fantastic advice. And, of course, this is just the beginning for you too, really. So I've got to ask, what's next for you? What's your big focus this year? And are there any teasers you can leave us with about what to expect? Because I would imagine there's going to be a few members of your community listening uh, waiting and hoping to find out uh, a few details of what they can expect. So what would you leave uh, for those people listening? So I would say that, I mean, first, I would like to just acknowledge how incredibly grateful I am for the pandemic. And, and I think that's kind of a crazy statement to make, right? But <laughs> um, it it gave a lot of people a chance that otherwise didn't have a chance. So to do new things, to create new systems, to build new infrastructure, Digital art, for example, has been around since the 60s, but it was really the pandemic that shut the museums down, that shut the galleries down, that also unlocked a lot of crypto wealth. And it was the crypto community and the artists that came together that said, hey, this NFT technology is interesting. We can use this. And so I find myself in such a fortunate place to be able to be around such innovative people like artists are. Mm. And thinking about, okay, well, now what do they need? Like, what do people need to be able to, okay, A, create art and B, collect art? And um, and because artists in many ways are like society's R&D. And 
So what I've been watching over the past year, which is really disturbing to me, is I've seen a lot of friends and a lot of people I I would call uh, acquaintances mm-hmm. have their wallets drained, their, their crypto wallets drained. They've been hacked. They've been fooled. They've been tricked. And so um, I've been diving into how this could possibly happen. So like I can give you an NFT as an example. Yeah. And if you accept this NFT and you hang on to it in your wallet, that has a certain type of smart contract. Okay, now I'm authorized to transfer everything else you have out of your wallet. So you can lose literally everything you have digitally by receiving an NFT. Wow. And and you don't and and again it kind of it goes back to these GPTs. Like you're you're you go to a website, you think this website is from an artist or a musician or a creator of somebody that you believe is is doing really great stuff. And you get an NFT from them. And then a couple of days later, you realize your wallet's drained. And then you're like, wait, how did that happen? And it happened because the place you thought you were going to was not actually the place <laughs> you were going to. It wasn't the artist that you thought it was. It was a different artist that was masquerading as the artist you thought it was. And so there's these whole, there's, there's, there's all of these um, real, uh, what I would describe as existential threats to the entire sector of Web3. Yeah around how do we help people that are new to Web3 come in and be safe? And really, I mean, for that matter, how do we help people that are already in it for the long time? <laughs> like, how do we keep them from losing all their stuff, right? So, <laughs> so, so I'm really fascinated. I'm really interested in this idea of um, the safety side of it. Because I think of this as such powerful technology, um, this double-edged sword stuff, like, the way you fix a double-edged sword is to have one side of the sword be safe, right? Have a, you know, have, have like a, I don't know. I mean, I, I, I like these kind of exacto knives because they have a good handle on top that you can hold on to when you cut things. Right. And so, yeah. um, so, so wallets need this sort of stuff. And then I feel that a lot more people should be collecting art. There was a period in the forties and fifties in America where everybody bought art, like yeah. literally every American would have, uh, they would usually buy one or two pieces a year. They would put it in their home. And this is gone. I mean, art now is seen as a luxury good. It's seen as an elite good. And, you know, things like books, things like music, like a good song can radically transform society, right? Yeah. A good book can change the world. When's the last time an artwork did that? It's just, I mean, it could, it should. It has that potential. But there's something about the distribution. There's something about the way that people actually experience art that I feel is 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 not letting it have the impact, the societal impact as possible. So both that idea of how do you bring the masses back to art collecting and, okay, now that people are beginning to, to collect digital assets, to hold on to digital assets, how do you, how do you keep them safe? Because the answer is not go give it to the third parties. As FTX shows us, we, we, we can't yeah. do that. <laughs> That's one lesson yeah. I think many learn the hard way. <laughs> yeah, 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 yeah. Well, we started our conversation talking about your origin story, what put you on this path. But I'm now going to ask you, was there a particular book that has inspired you on your journey that we can add to our Amazon wish list? We've got a bit of a tradition on the podcast where I always ask my guests to leave something. What, what book would you leave uh, or let us add to the wish list and why? Yeah, you bet. So there's a book, uh, it's called Structures, and the the, the, the subtitle of it is um, Or Why Things Don't Fall Down. Yeah. And I loved this book. It's very practical. It takes a look at the things that humans have built over time. So, for example, boats or buildings or bridges, um, even very, very uh, practical things like clothing. And it looks at why do they work? Why, like, why does a skyscraper actually <laughs> stay up? <laughs> and, and it turns out there's some incredibly important ideas there around um, just basic material science. And most people are afraid of this kind of stuff. Most people, when they hear jargon, um, torsion, fractures, uh, uh, fractures, annealing, um, you know, all of this kind of stuff, you just like, okay, I'm not going to read that. My eyes glaze over. Yeah, yeah. But there's actually some concepts in this book that are incredibly easy to understand. And I think it's just amazing. It will blow your mind. And for me personally, it really got me thinking about why do certain things last for a very long time and other things are just fads. They come and go. 
And I think a lot of it has to do with the structure of it and being able to build something that doesn't fall down. So whether that's a digital thing like software, like we're building, or if it's a physical thing like a bridge, to be able to think in terms of the materials and what do we have to do or what did people do before us with these materials that we could learn from? Um, if there's one lesson of history is that people don't read lessons in history, right? <laughs> like it's important. It's really, really important to learn from the people that came before us. There's a lot of good stuff there. There's a lot of knowledge that's built up there. And this book is incredibly condensed knowledge, but in a way that strips the jargon, it's just accessible. So I loved it. It's one of my favorite books. Awesome. I'm incredibly yeah. intrigued. I'm going to be adding that to the Amazon wish list straight away. And for anyone listening that would just like to find out more information about the work that you're doing, maybe even join your community, what's the best starting point for everything? Yeah, so I'm on Twitter mainly. I don't do Facebook anymore. I don't do Instagram that much. Uh, I, I still really love Twitter. I think Twitter is a great place. Um, yeah. You get punched a lot, but I, <laughs> Feedback is good, <laughs> always, <laughs> even when it hurts. So I'm uh, I'm on Twitter. Uh, that's probably the easiest to find me. Um, I, I I do have a personal website. I'm still kind of old school there. So please do look me up. And um, I try my best to answer all questions from people. Not always super fast, but um, yeah, please. I, I, I love feedback. Well, I'll get those links added to the show notes so people can find you nice and easy. We've covered so much there in a short amount of time from defining property in a digital environment, understanding how we can secure personal data in an age where it has become fully commoditized. Will the digital economy stay or go bust? And also exchanging your thoughts on the current state of the NFT market, the future of NFTs, busting a few myths along the way and even have time, even having time to leave us with a cracking book too. So a big thank you for sharing that. And of course, your inspiring origin story. Thank you. Yeah. Thank you. Sean's passion about developing technologies for consumer electronics and internet services that empower humans and focusing on blockchain-related projects really shine through today. It was, and I was particularly intrigued to learn more about how property rights were indeed invented for land, real physical property. And then, of course, it progressed to intellectual property, the ideas that people come up with. But none of this has extended to the digital world. And because of this oversight, millions of us give away what we've created online and our personal data for free to entities and big tech companies that then go on to profit from it every single day. And we don't get a cut because we don't own it. So it's good to hear how Bitmark intends to change that. But it is a big, big topic. And I'd love to hear from you, your thoughts. I'm sure there are going to be a few different sides of this tale. And I'd love to hear all sides of it. So please email me, techblogwriteroutlook.com, Twitter, LinkedIn, Instagram at Neil C. Hughes. And I also cordially invite you to join me again tomorrow where we will explore another topic together. But just a big thank you for listening today. And until next time, don't be a stranger. Oh, 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 oh,